And I believe even when we get there, we're going to be learning throughout eternity all of the things that he's done for us and all of the things he's prepared for us. If we really want things to be different, how many of you would like to have things to be different? I know you would. I ask this question all the time and one way or the other. And everybody says, oh, man, yeah, I want things to be different. Well, beginning tonight, we can't take our choices lightly. You have to be serious with yourself. You don't have to be serious just around other people as it pertains to what you say or, or tell them that you're going to do. You, you, need to be, you need to be serious with you. You need to be serious with you. And, and I know oftentimes that, that, that puts a little, uh, a little pressure on your flesh, but, but your flesh needs to be pressured. Because your flesh, your flesh is really not interested in the kingdom. <laughs> That's why you're going to get new flesh. Huh? Uh, this, is, this is contaminated flesh that we live in now. And, uh, and, and we need to understand that, uh, that our flesh uh, has, to be, uh, uh, has to be taken care of. And nobody can take care of your flesh but you. Hallelujah. Praise God. I mean, the only, the only, uh, the only no that your flesh knows is your no. I mean, that's why how many times when parents are raising their children and they tell their children no. And it's like they said yes. <laughs> huh? You know, it's training them uh, like we're training ourselves so that we know how to say no. Huh? Let me just tell you right, t right now. No is the N word. No is. And it always has been. You can give different names to different letters, but no is the N word. It's the word that we all need to be able to use for every decision, for every thought, and in every relationship. It needs to be no. We're, we're going to look at more to know first. Well, I want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Uh, Let's hold that verse for just a second. Uh, Solomon, uh, uh, this night that we're going to begin to read about, uh, Solomon uh, had, had, uh, had given a thousand burnt offerings. Now, you know, he had, a lot of, he had a lot of servants. So, I mean, he wasn't personally doing it, but he was personally uh, overseeing it. He gave a thousand burnt offerings. Now we don't understand things like that because uh, we've never had to do things like that. But, but that was something that showed their honor uh, to the father. So he gave him, he gave a thousand burnt offerings. And we begin in verse seven. In that night, did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let your promise unto David my father be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this thy people that is so great? And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of your enemies, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted 
unto you. And I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before you, neither shall there any after you have the like. I mean, Solomon had it all. Hmm? Solomon didn't ask for anything but wisdom and knowledge to deal with the things in life that he needed to deal with. Yes, the people under him, but also himself and the things that he would have to deal with personally. He asked the Father for wisdom. You know, that's a novel thought. Many people are raised to think that God is some sort of a cosmic Santa, and all we do is present our Christmas list to him, or our birthday list, or whatever it is. But the truth is, the best way to get to him is when we desire to know him better and to have the wisdom to deal wisely with all the affairs of life. In James 1.5, we read, if any of you lack wisdom, this is if you want to know more. If you want to know more, then you've got to ask the right questions. If any, didn't he get everything else? Because he asked for wisdom and knowledge. Yes, he had a lot already, but he knew that that wasn't sufficient. What he had monetarily wasn't sufficient. The amount of servants he had, they were plenty sufficient for what he was doing, but he wanted more than that. He wanted to know more. In James 1.5, uh, the apostle said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him or her. So what, did, what does that tell me right there? It tells me that you and I can have a conversation with the Father. That's right. You don't have to be on your knees. You don't have to have your eyes closed. You can be talking to him like I'm talking to you. And certainly, uh, he, he's, the, he's the very best one to be honest with because he always already knows the truth about you anyway. He already knows your heart. He knows if you're asking in faith. He knows if you're serious or not. Huh? I mean, we've given Santa Claus that place, but Santa Claus don't know how to do that. But God does. And so when we ask him, just like, just like Solomon asked him, he said, Father, I want wisdom. I need wisdom for my life. Maybe, maybe I don't rule over hundreds or thousands of people, but I want wisdom for my life because I want to be able to do things that will not only bring peace and fulfillment into my life, but I want to be a blessing to others, and I need wisdom to do that. You know, you need wisdom to put up with people. You need wisdom to even think about wanting to put up with people. That's why it was important to him. That's why God was excited about that. And really, I believe part of it is he loves to have dialogue with his kids. He loves for his kids to ask him for things that are important to him, glory to God. And you know it's important to him that you be wise. It's important to him that you be knowledgeable. It's important to him uh, that he can use you uh, to help influence other people. You know, not every Christian wants to do that. Now, of course, I believe that you're part of the 25 percenters in this house, and that's your desire to continue to produce. And because of that, he's going to help you do that. But you have to continue. As you need answers, he's the one that's got them. Glory to God. He's the one that's got them. And you just talk to him like he was sitting right there. Because you know what? He is. He's sitting right just because you can't see him. Just because he's the invisible God doesn't mean he isn't. All we need to do and all you and I need to do is begin to develop that habit of doing that. Only you keep you from knowing more. If you want to know more about your life, about the things of God, about how to handle the affairs of life, regardless of what they are, situations and circumstances, only you keep you from knowing what you need to know. Wisdom defined is this. Wisdom defined is God's heart for all matters. 
Did you hear that? Wisdom, wisdom is God's heart for all matters. In other words, there isn't anything that God doesn't have an answer for. And the wisdom of God, as we see in the book of Proverbs that, uh, that Solomon wrote by the Spirit of God, we see wisdom for everyday life. I'm going to guarantee if you read, a, you read a proverb a day and you read a proverb a day every day and every month of every year, I'm going to tell you what, wisdom's going to come up on the inside of you. And listen, a lot of the stuff doesn't look like it's very deep, but the truth is it really is. And it will, it will put you in a position where there will be things that you will be able to help others with that, uh, uh, that have them troubled, but they have you troubled no more because now you have the answer. So wisdom is God's heart for all matters. Sounds to me like it's the mind of Christ. It's the mind of Christ. The word knowledge is mental quickness and skill. Also, the mind of Christ. You know, when we renew our mind, then we put our mind in a position where it can be quick, where it can be skilled, where it can be astute, where it can be a receptive to do everything we do in the natural better than we've ever done before. And that all comes from wanting the wisdom of God, wanting to know more. I mean, listen, we've all got friends that uh, uh, from, a, from an educational perspective, you know, they've got us hands down, but yet many of them don't know anything about anything. Then there's you and I who have come into the kingdom of God. We've had a relationship with he and his word long enough now that I'm telling you, we got some answers that absolutely most people can't figure out. But to us, is there anybody in here that there are things that are much easier for you now than they used to be? I mean, they're just, it's just like, man, here it is. You know, uh, raised in a denominational church that promoted the Word of God, but not, in a, not from a revelation uh, perspective. Uh, we heard the Word, we knew the Word, but we, we, didn't, we didn't use the Word because we didn't expect the Word to do anything but just be the Word. But once we found out that the word was alive and we began to speak it and we began to act on it and we began to do what it, what it told us to do, it began to work. And see, listen, the great, the great portion of the, of the Christian community, they, they think the word is just something that some guy learned in, in, uh, in, in seminary and uh, this is a job where he don't do much but play golf and show up on Sunday and, uh, you know, light a candle and whatever give you three points in a poem, but that's religion. But God's not interested in you having a religious experience. He's interested in you having a, a relationship with him that'll absolutely change your life. Revelation is spiritual wisdom as well as intelligence. When you begin to get revelation from God's word, it will, no long, it, will, it will no not only give you spiritual insight that most Christians never receive, but it will also make you sharper intellectually. God's word is powerful. Hallelujah. Remember the word says of itself that everything else will pass away, but his word will never pass away. So the word in you, the word on you, the word used by you in this life, it's the most powerful thing in the universe. Hallelujah. It is what changes things in people's lives. So now let's, let's look at something here real quick. This is what we're, uh, we're, we're endeavoring to do, this, uh, this little piece of paper. You don't have to look at it really, but what we want to do is we want to use this section. Uh, I want to I give you a why, a how, and, uh, and some of the distractions uh, that, uh, uh, that are thrown at us to keep us uh, from knowing more. Uh, first of all, uh, I, want, uh, uh, I, want, I want you to know that uh, uh, we do this so that our lives will reflect his will. You want to know more so that your life will reflect his will. Remember, that's what Jesus wanted to do. 
We also know that you can just scratch it down. We don't have it on the overhead. Ephesians 5.1 says that we should be imitators or followers of God, God as dear children, which means when we do what he tells us to do, then that creates a great strength in our life. We can see a verse here, Luke 22, verse uh, uh, 22, 42b. Nevertheless, Jesus saying in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. In order, in order to uh, know more, we've got to give up things. And that means we've got to give up what's less valuable, which let me just be honest with you, is everything. Everything is less valuable than what he has, but we also see, and we've also seen it in the story of Solomon, huh? he turned his back on asking him for riches, power, his enemies, and asked for wisdom. Because wisdom, and Proverbs talks about it, wisdom is a principal thing. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Also, we see, uh, we see that uh, um, the how of this is, uh, is through FaceTime with him. You, ha you gotta have FaceTime with the Father. You've gotta have quiet time. You've gotta have a time where uh, you've kinda tuned everything out. You know, many guys that are out all the time, you know, uh, driving around, it's a perfect opportunity, really, to just, uh, uh, to just have dialogue with the Father, you know, just, uh, and you know, if you're a little bit nervous about your experience with God and, and you're in your truck alone, ain't nobody in there but you. Huh? Ain't nobody in there to make fun of you but you. And you'll try to do that, too. You'll try to make fun of yourself. You say, what am I talking to God for? That's the craziest thing I've ever done, you know? Just tell yourself, shut up. Shut up. I want to hear from God. But it gives you an opportunity. That's what a quiet time is about. You're by yourself, huh? You've got everything else shut down around you. That's how we do it. Psalm 63, uh, 63, 1, uh, the, the B part of the verse, uh, David said it this way. He says, early will I seek thee. Well, you know, uh, I'm a proponent of you just find a time to seek him. Huh? I'm a proponent of that, you know? I mean, you know, some people can, can jump out of the bed and, and, and hit, the, hit the floor land and just ready to, you know, charge hell with a water pistol, you know? You know, I'm a, you know, I'm not that, all that excited about getting up. You know, PK's up, she's having a quiet time, huh? And, you know, I'm thinking, golly, I'm not gonna get up yet, you know? In the first place, it's cold. You say, why don't you turn up your heater? Well, because we just found out it's healthier to keep the, keep the heater down. You know what I'm saying? We don't, want, you know, we don't want stuff to you know, grow in the house. And it won't grow. It won't grow in the temperature we keep it. I can tell you that for sure. Huh? Huh? It won't grow and I won't get out of bed. I mean, so, you know, which kind of keeps me from growing also, you know. <laughs> but you need to pick out a time. You need to pick out a time. Now, now, you know, it's probably, it's probably not good after you've, you know, had a long, hard day of work and, uh, uh, and then you've watched something you shouldn't have watched to start with and then expect to, expect to stay awake. You're probably not going to stay awake. So you need to find a quiet time. You know, start with something that's realistic. Uh, you know, don't say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading the Bible for an hour. Well, good, good for you, huh? <laughs> Is that how many, how many times is it going to take for you to add up an hour, you know? No, just make a time. Realize that uh, uh, having some face time with him uh, will begin to uh, reveal things that you need to know. Uh, and then uh, things that uh, prevent that. Uh, we, we must not allow the enemy or our flesh to bully us into giving up. And you need to begin that tonight. You know, you know you better, even if you're married, you know, you know you better than your spouse knows you. And they know you better than you'd probably like for them to. <laughs> but they do. But you have to just tell yourself, no, uh -uh, that ain't happening. I'm not going to have the same life today or this week or this month that I had last week or last month. I'm not going to go into a new year with a new opportunity 
and not take advantage of it. Now, God's not going to stop loving you if you just drag through another year. He's not going to stop loving you. But why don't you love you? Because you loving you is what it's going to take to do what it takes to overcome your, leth your lethargy and your apathy. So you can't let your flesh bully you into giving up beginning tonight. James 4, 7, easy way to do it. You submit yourself to God. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The closer you get to God, the more face time you spend, the more word you hear, the more word you apply, the easier it becomes to say no. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the first part of the verse, Paul said, I keep under or I keep my body in, under. In other words, you tell your body. You tell your body. Huh? Your body's not going to, your body is not what tells you the stuff that you do. You do that. That's why you have to tell yourself, no, that's over in my life. No longer will that be a part of my life. And guess what? You can do it. Hallelujah. You can do it. Because if anyone can do it, everyone can do it. You can do it. How many of you in here have said no to things long enough that they are no more a part of your life? I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it looks like a major stronghold. It reminds me of a song that says, Jesus is bigger. And he is bigger. Glory to God. I don't care what it is. More to do. More to do. Everybody likes to be busy doing things. More to do. By virtue of being a part of Jesus' body, we are called to assist in his business in a local company. We'll, we'll give you a verse here and a little bit on it. Because we are part of the body of Christ, we are called to assist in his business. Ephesians 5.30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 1 Corinthians 12.18, but now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Not only did he do that in the physical body that we have, but he sets people in a body to be a part of that body so that body can be complete. Now, the experience that I've had over this last 30 plus years is there are people set in the body, but they leave the body. But there's always a replacement for those that leave. Why is that? Because he's going to complete his body. Every local body is going to be able to be complete if the people in the body understand that that's the only place they can be complete is when they fulfill their place in the body. Matthew 16, 18, uh, Jesus talking to, to Peter and talking about, he said, upon this rock, the rock of revelation, he said, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, the church is going to get beat, built. The local churches are going to get built. He builds local churches. And then he oversees local churches being a part of his overall body. You know, I don't have to make contact with another pastor or another body member in this city. That's God's business. My business is to oversee this body. Your business is to fit in this body, to be a part of this body. Because when we're in one mind and one accord, then we're able to fulfill our part. Now, if somebody down the street ain't fulfilling their part, that's not our problem. He is going to be sure that those that do their part are going to be fulfilled personally as well as corporately. Acts 4.23, and being let go, some of the, uh, some of the disciples had been, uh, uh, had been incarcerated. And being let go, they went to their own company 
and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Company defined is those of the same mind and purpose. Those of the same mind and purpose. You know, not every Christian hears what you hear. Not every church presents what we present. Not every church is as passionate as we are. So it's important that we understand that we're different. We're not better. We're just different. Amen? We're not in competition with anybody. We're just different. I believe that he is bigger. See, that's why I'm passionate. (laughs) That's why I'm still excited. Because the more I know about him, the bigger he gets. And the bigger he gets, the louder I get, praise God. And the more passion I have about what he wants to do in people's lives. Well, that makes us different, glory to God. And that means you that are called to be in this house, then you are going to have to deal with your flesh more than most Christians have to deal with their flesh. Now, not have to for any other reason other than the word of God directs us to. Hmm? Listen, you live your life, but I'll tell you, when you hear the truth, There comes a point in time where you're not comfortable living it the way you used to. That's why we're still here as a church. That's why we didn't walk away when it became uncomfortable many, many, many times. And many of you have been here long enough, you know what that looks like. Hmm? But when you're passionate about the bigger one, then you don't sweat the small stuff. You don't get excited about it, but you don't sweat it because he's bigger. He's bigger, glory to God. He's able. He's bigger and he's able to take you through those things. All of us as individuals, all of us, we all have to deal with things. But when you see him as big as he is, you'll be able to deal with him. And then you throw a bunch of people together that can deal with their own mess. Hmm? Glory to God. Now they can change the city. They can change the city. I believe we've already made a dent in our city, but I believe there's a greater dent to be made. I believe there are people in this city that need to find out that Jesus is real, that the word of God is alive, that it's the only way to live because it is the only life that's available for people. Oh, you can live a carnal life, but that's no life at all. His life is life. Amen. I don't know why I took the lid off this. Mm, that's why. So company, those of same mind and purpose. Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Joints, you can't, the Bible uses joint. Now, do they still call them joints or what? <laughs> every joint supplies. No, every, every joint de- depreciates. <laughs> It don't supply nothing, you know. I mean, it'll jack with your cells, huh? Boy, I think you're moving though. Whoo, baby, you know. How fast we going? <laughs> Say we're sitting at a red light. <laughs> Which every joint supplies. Every part in the body. You know. I mean, people brand new, they begin sitting next to you and they get, they get a little, go, they get a little going and say, God, dog, what, what's up with these people? You know, that's what I first thought when I got around people like this. I thought, what is the matter with these people? I mean, they're raising their hands, they're shouting, they're singing loud. I said, can't they hear? <laughs> huh? I said, what is wrong with these people? But it was who, who, who's in them? See, when he's big on the inside of you, it'll push all that nonsense out of you. You want to raise your hand just to get some movement going, huh? Every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. What does that do? Makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
I'll tell you, when we're walking the way we're supposed to, man, it's exciting to be around one another. Yes. Hallelujah. When everybody is, uh, is taking care of their business, man, it's exciting to be around a people like that. You know, that's why most people don't, don't, don't care about being part of a church, it, because most of them are just as bad as, as living in the world. Yeah, that's right. There's as much drama and nonsense going on in the church, huh? Come on, you've all been a part of some of those churches. You know what that looks like? I mean, people haven't cleared the door and they're talking about somebody. Isn't that right? Well, yeah, you know what I heard about so-and-so? No, and I don't give a rip. Don't you shut up. That's none of your business either, you know? What I heard about somebody. You know what I heard about you? Because I'll guarantee if you, tell, if, you, if, you, if you let somebody tell you or you tell somebody what you heard, they're going to they're gonna tell on you also. Crazy, absolutely crazy. I, live, you know, I went to a church like that. My mom was like that. She was, she was like, did you see what's her name? She wore that same dress last week. I, I said, well, you know, if you feel bad about that, why don't you go buy another dress, you lightweight? Huh? Come on, you ever been women around like that? Now, I don't know why she dresses like that. What's none of your business? You buy her clothes? Now, I do believe that there's a, you know, there's a correct way to dress. But, but I mean, uh, what you got on ain't nobody's business. It's nobody's business at all. As a matter of fact, none of it's your business. Amen. You know, our business is to take care of us. If something comes up that we have an opportunity to have somebody's ear or, or they ask us what we think about something, you know, then, then that gives us an opportunity. Hmm? But otherwise, we ought to just zip it, glory to God. How many of you, know, how many of you wish sometimes you hadn't have said what you said? Woo! Man, husbands and wives, I mean, husbands and wives, have you ever said something? And Lord God, you're still dealing with it. <laughs> well, you, remember when you said so-and-so? I said, sweetheart. That's 14 years ago. <laughs> let it go. Let it go. Huh? Words, man. You get them darlings out there, you just can't. There they are. Just like God's words, they're still out there. He spoke the universe. That's how, you know, the scientists can't get smart enough to find how far out they are. huh? Because when he set it in motion, it hadn't stopped yet. Glory to God. Same thing with us when we begin to work together. Again, let's look at the why, how, and the distractions in this area of becoming, uh, becoming one who wants to do more. Number, number one, we do more because it brings glory to the Father. Full stop. No better reason than what we do knowing it brings glory to the Father. John 15, 8, Jesus made this statement, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. In other words, your life begins to take on the image of his life. Number two, we find our place in the body. You don't just hang out in a body. You do something in a body. Are you listening to me? Huh? And that is in order for you to be fulfilled and in order for the body to function in the optimum way. Aren't you glad all your stuff's working tonight? Yes. And see, your stuff's working and you don't even know it's working except you know it's working. All that stuff in there you can't even pronounce. Your colon, your semicolon, all of those things, huh? Those things are working and they're working. And listen, I've told you, you need to talk to them. You need to talk to them. You know, Jesus is bigger than colonitis and, huh? And bursitis and, uh, huh? He's bigger than all that stuff. You got to talk to your, talk to, you got to talk to your organs. Now, not at Walmart with people standing around. You got to be wise when you're talking to your organs because your organs ain't nobody else's business. Talk to your organs, talk to the tissues, your arteries, your veins, 
your valentine, huh? All of your glands, you talk to them. Say, heart, listen to me. You're my heart. You're in a body that was bought by the blood of the lamb. He owns you. And you're going to operate perfectly all the days of my life. I don't have to be concerned about you, heart. You beat with the rhythm of God. Hallelujah. Kidneys, you function perfectly. You'll not retain anything. You'll get shut of everything, glory to God. Liver, liver. Amen. Liver that I had drowned for years. Liver, be delivered from all of that stuff, huh? Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's up to you and I to make these decisions to be like him. And we find our place in the body. And when we find our place, you know what? When you find it, you'll enjoy it. Huh? You selfish outfit. <laughs> honestly. Honestly. And I've said this before. You know, we've got wonderful people in this house and, and great givers. But listen, listen, just, just a financial gift is not the only thing that you're valuable to the body for. Honestly, you know, there's a lot going on here and there's going to be a lot more going on here. But in order for that to operate correctly, there have to be people in place. People who have the heart of the house. This is not church as usual. And I know most of you know that. Huh? I mean, we're a family that, listen... We live and breathe this opportunity to honor our God. And we love people. And there are people in your sphere of influence that don't know him. They may be stuck in some dead church occasionally, listening to dead messages occasionally, and not being able to fulfill or to enjoy the life that God has paid for. That's a tragedy to live in this life in a country where we're free to worship and people not know the truth. That's why it's valuable to have a house like this where we can be a part of it and not ashamed, glory to God, and not embarrassed about where we go or what we do, or not intimidated by people who seem to think, well, you know, that's all you do is church, church. It's all you talk about now is church, church. And you tell them all you talk about is problems and problems <laughs> and problems. And give me church. Isn't that right? Huh, they want to call you up and talk, ah, did I tell you about that? Blah, 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 blah. And they said, I've got blah, 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 blah. I got to go now to church. <laughs> <laughs> or you might say something real serious like, you know, I'd, I'd pray for you, but I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> right. Man. We got a great opportunity, praise God. Can you imagine that? Get yourself in a position where you spent more time around people that are excited, that are happy, that are energized, that are hopeful, huh? That are about the Father's business than those folks that just drain the mess out of you. I mean, when you see them coming, you know, oh, I am gonna get a load right now, huh? And you just stand there. Whew. I mean, come on. Some of them are your friends and relatives, you know? Aren't they? I mean, you, you need to get the Komasyama to say something to them. Just say, God dang, aren't you tired of that life? Well, I mean, you know, this is the way everybody lives. Not me. Not me. I was around it long enough. I, not me no more. Hmm? No more. I'm not going to live that life anymore. 
I mean, I heard that uh, around my mom. My mom, God Almighty, she would never shut up, you know? <laughs> Talking about people. Talking about people. People. People who need people. They didn't need her verbiage, I'll tell you that for sure. She was not good. I don't know. She probably got some great instruction her first couple of days in heaven. <laughs> Jesus probably told her, uh, Ruth, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> That's why I'm going to really watch myself because I, you know, I just want to get up there and be just real mild and meek. <laughs> Hi, Master. <laughs> We find our place in the body, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some do, but exhorting one another and so much more the time as you see the day coming, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, huh? Yes. Provoking one another. Say, what do you, what do you, come on, what do you, what are you whining about? Mm -hmm. Well, well, things aren't, what are you whining about? Did you forget how big your God is? Well, I know, but no. No, you got to keep your butt out of it. If you know, you know he's bigger. Well, but you don't understand how it's been on me. Oh, please. Please. Who are you? Do you think that whatever you've gone through or are going through has never been gone through before? Huh? Sure, it hurts. But it doesn't have to hurt once you know him. You can take a deep breath and say, no, not no, but no. I'm not, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to let what I can't control control me. But I can control me. So I'm just going to go on about my business. Loving God, having faith in God. Amen. 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 Listen, you're never going to get anybody excited about your God. Huh? If you just go along with their mess. You might, you just might come and say, whoa, whoa. Have you ever heard about Jesus? Oh, you know, I've heard about Jesus. I've been going to church for years. I know that. I know that. But you obviously haven't heard of Jesus. Because he already took care of all that stuff. He already took care of it. Well, 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 nothing. You're not well. <laughs> nothing well about your life. More to hope for. No, I didn't finish. We need to look at number three, the things that will uh, get in our way. We won't allow other building projects. Remember, we're building his church to become more important. It's easy to do. Hey, listen, Cowboys are going to go eight and eight, nine and seven, whether you watch them or not. Hmm? Yankees are going to go 10, 12, 13 years without a World Series whether I watch them or not. Hmm? Patriots are going to lose one of these years, <laughs> whether you watch them or not. Amen. Unless they can learn a new way to get pictures. <laughs> Matthew 6.33 makes it very simple. Seek first, huh? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, the right way of doing things. Then everything else that people are scrambling for will become yours. Last, we're going to talk about more to hope for. More to hope for. Aren't you glad it's not New Year's until midnight? <laughs> more to hope for. There's more to hope for. Huh? Don't ditch your hope. We're going to see here. Without hope, there is no need for faith. Without hope, there is no need for faith. We're going to show you. Getting your hopes up set you up for the promises of God to become yours experientially. We've had people in the past, you know, uh, you know you'll be encouraging people. People, uh, may, they, may be get a, they may get a diagnosis or, uh, you know, there may be a, uh, a relationship issue or something and, and you encourage them and, and uh, you know, you tell them, don't give up, don't give up. And then there'll be somebody beside you say, well, you know, you better not tell them to get their hopes up. What if it doesn't work? You know, you just want to say, shut up. Nobody asks you. Of course, they don't know that if your hope's not up, 
you got nothing to put your faith against. You got nothing to put your faith against if your hope is not. You, people, you ought to give people hope. Now listen, if you do that, you're going to be the exception. Because if you get somebody's hopes up, you know what's going to happen? They're going to go to some of their, their, their friends who, who don't know much about the things of God and may even be Christians, and they're going to say, well, you know, so-and-so said that, you know, that I could believe God. Oh, well, you know, you never know if it's God's will or not. Mm. That's why your company knows what the will of God is. That's why we should all know what the will of God is so that any time we're dealing with anything, we'll have something to put our faith against because we'll have the hope of what his word declares belongs to us. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know it, living Bible. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Hope is to trust in or to confidently expect. Something that you can trust in or confidently expect. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. In other words, when the answer comes. The word deferred is to be drawn out or prolonged. God doesn't want what belongs to us to be drawn out. He wants us to know that what Jesus paid for belongs to us. So we'll have that hope and we'll have the faith to put behind it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you got to have some hope, or faith can't give it substance. It is the evidence of things not seen. Substance defined as steadfast, confident foundation. It is the foundation. It is the foundation of what we need. The evidence is the proof and conviction. This is all in the Word of God. The Word of God gives you hope, and then faith will bring it to pass. The Word of God tells you what belongs to you, faith will bring it to you. But you have to hope. I'm hoping for more. I'm believing God for more. More what? More opportunities. More people more miracles, more salvations, more Holy Ghost baptisms, more deliverance, more people that are free from things that have had them bound. Huh? You know what? You get your hope in that direction and the other stuff that you spend your time thinking about that you want will begin to show up. And even if it never does, you won't miss it because you got your eyes focused on what every one of us should be hoping for. And that's an increased body. Not just this body, but the body universal. Amen. Okay, why, how, and the distractions. Why we hope, hope more? Because faith needs a project. If you're not hoping for nothing, there's nothing to put your faith against. Your faith has no work if you don't give it something to hope for. Maybe you've got some relatives. Maybe you've got some relatives or friends. They, they, they need you to begin to uh, actually believe that, uh, uh, that, they, that they'd fit in the kingdom of God. Maybe you've got some relatives that are strung out that, uh, that you need to begin to uh, actually believe can get delivered. You know, most of us have been delivered from something. Well, if we got delivered, why can't they get delivered? Huh? Why wouldn't you want them to be delivered? Oh, I don't know. I don't know how they'd fit in here. We're still trying to figure out how you fit in here. Once you fit in with him, he'll show you how to fit in. And you'll find a house like this where, I mean, just look around. I mean, you know, look at all these misfits fitting in. Huh? Look at all these people that we're giving up on. Huh? 
When my parents' families, uh, when they found out I had gone into the ministry, I, probably two or three of them had heart attacks. <laughs> I know one thing, never, they never called me to encourage me. Huh? They knew me and they reminded me every time that I saw them. They reminded me who I was. And I said, let me remind you who he is. Because it's who he is that will make you who you're supposed to be. Hallelujah. So yeah, you're, you're not having a hard time remembering who I was. But I'm going to tell you what. He destroyed who I was. And he's, uh, he's on a total makeover now. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. So... Uh, Faith needs a project, Hebrews 11, 1a. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We've got to, we've, we've got to have something that needs, needs work if we expect our faith to do anything with it. How do we experience? We experience our hope by knowing, speaking, and doing the Word. If you're not doing the Word, then start. If you're not speaking the Word, then start. the way you do it. You just begin to speak it and do it. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. You know, that reminds me of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Abraham, uh, who uh, Romans 4.18, he said, uh, who against hope Believed in hope. In other words, when it looks hopeless, get your hope up. Don't let something hopeless cause you to lose your hope. Because you know what? You can just remember what we heard tonight. He's bigger. They can tell you got so much time. They don't make it hopeless. Unless you allow it to be hopeless. And he'll allow what you allow. Or you can fight. Say, no, I'm going to exercise my faith on the hope that I see in the Word of God. And if I'm going down, I'm going to go down believing and speaking. And don't you get upset at somebody like that, whether they don't want to fight or do want to fight. You make a decision what you want to do. Amen. You know, dying for a child of God is nothing but one last breath in this house and then standing in his house. So, you know, if you've got any confidence at all in what he has for you, you will not be fearful of death. Now, I'm not excited about it. I'm going to be with him forever. I'm not in any hurry. Plus, he needs somebody that's a little bit loud and crazy like myself. And he needs me to be surrounded by loud and crazy people like y'all, huh? So that we can do some damage while we're here. Amen? Glory to God. We can take some with us. Hallelujah. James 1, 122, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know, that's real easy to do. People can sit around in church all their life. Really never do anything but go to church, and they do a great job of going to church but they never really believe and embrace and begin to do what they need to do. And all of a sudden, something hits them. And they go, oh, oh, I go to church all the time. What happened? This is not just about going to church. This is about doing church, which means doing the Word of God. That's why God's got a, got, you know, that's what's given him a bad name. Well, you know, I don't, sister so-and-so, well, she was so sweet. She was in church all the time, and I heard her praying and everything. She prayed all the time, and look what happened to her. Listen, take care of you. You don't know what she was doing and what she wasn't doing. That's none of your business. I mean, don't, don't, don't be concerned about it. You know, the Bible says that you judge yourself. Just judge yourself. Deal with yourself. Deal with what you can deal with. You can't deal with 
sister so-and-so or brother talk a lot. But you can deal with you. That's who you're designed to deal with. Hmm? Number three, in order to, uh, in order to avoid uh, all, at all cost, we must avoid exposing ourselves to religious lies or traditions, which in essence is what I was just talking about, or fear promoted by the word. I'm going to tell you, fear will destroy your life. Fear will destroy your life. Mark 7, 13, Jesus was talking about uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the wooden seas and the couldn't seas. He was talking about them. Their tradition had made, made the word of God of no effect whatsoever. And that's what it does. Tradition has no power whatsoever. The only thing that has power is the truth in God's word. And then 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Fear tries to come into your life. Say, what are you doing? I do not have a spirit of fear. My mom had a spirit of fear. I mean, it, if, if it started thundering, she and I were under the bed. I said, you know, I was a little bitty kid. I said, what are we doing? Well, it's thundering. I said, well, does thunder hurt you? Well, no, but there may be lightning. Well, I said, does lightning hurt you? She said, well, if it strikes the house. I said, well, how often does that happen? <laughs> she said, not very often. <laughs> I said, well, I'm having trouble breathing under the bed. Could we get out from under here? <laughs> In my chair underneath here, you know, it's a little cheap bed about that far off. They're, you know, you're pressed underneath. The craziest thing I've ever seen. Spirit of fear, huh? Spirit of fear. She worried about stuff that was 13 years down the road. Huh? She wasn't the least bit surprised when she got her diagnosis. Not the least. Not the least bit, not the least bit surprised. Well, I just, you know, you know, grandma died of this. Well, so that's great, mom. So what do you got in mind? Well, I don't know. I might take chemo once. I said, okay, cool. She took it. Got an extra year and a half, two years. Came back, and she left. Was I mad at her? No. No, but it taught me a great lesson. Hmm? I'm not going to entertain what happened to somebody else. I'm going to entertain what he did for me. I'm going to declare what he did for me. Hmm? I'm going to declare what he did for me. I'm going to declare what he did for me. Because what he did for me is bigger than what the enemy can do to me. Glory to God. Hmm? The enemy has no power unless I give it to him. And so I'll tell you one thing for sure. I'm going to talk right. I'm going to do my best to live right. Hmm? And I'm going to give him a headache every day. Hmm? He's going to wish he got me sometime before I was 32 and how old I am now. Glory to God. And you know what? You ought to want to do that same thing because it's free. The word is medicine to all your flesh. Huh? Don't let the world lie to you. Don't let your religious friends lie to you. When something happens, don't let them start talking that smack. Huh? You just walk away. Just walk away. I don't care what they say. You just walk away. Don't listen to that. Huh? Because you're going to have to deal with it. Hmm? And you know what that looks like when you have to deal with that. More life is available to those who want more. I want more life. But I don't want to wait till in the morning. I want to start right now. I want to have more life right now. I want to have more peace, more joy. Those cards, you can take a look at those right now if you would. And we're going to pray here in just a moment. But um, um, I am done with whatever it is because it keeps me from pursuing more. What are you thinking about? What are you involved in that keeps you really from, from knowing more about him? Just put it on there. We're going to put it in the slammer here in a little bit when we leave. Huh? That's what you do with, you flush it. And that's what anything is that stands between you and what belongs to you. Huh? It's a load of it. 
in the middle, I am done with because it has kept me from doing more. Just like I said, you have a building project that's in the way of the project that the Father's given you. And you think it's going to mean more to you. Let me just help you right now. It's not. Don't get mad at me because I know the truth. Personal projects will not produce like God's projects. They just won't do it. And number three, I am done with whatever because it has hindered my faith and confidence. Maybe listening to somebody. Maybe spending, around, spending time around people who are fearful and negative. And I'm not telling you that it's easy to move away from people or to just let people drop out of your life. But it's your life. In order to protect your life, you've got to protect your company. That is the company that you keep. If you've got some things that you can write in there on each and every one of those lines, just take a couple of, couple of moments, if you would, and write those. And then when we are dismissed here in just a few moments, uh, uh, you can uh, just drop those in the commode. That's the only thing to put in there, those, because those are not hooked up to plumbing. So don't... <laughs> Don't be trying to relieve yourself of any other issues, okay? Huh? As a matter of fact, I think we bought those with the express uh, desire to return them. So don't be trying to take the lids off of them or any of that stuff, okay? Because we don't just happen to have four toilets sitting around the church. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is an illustrated sermon, the stuff you write on those lines is worse than the stuff you put in those every day. And if you put it in there and you see it like you see the other disappear, then that's exactly what it will do. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, are you excited? I'm excited for you. I'm believing to see things transpire in your life that you cannot even fathom. I believe for those of you that are willing to focus according to his word, this will be the very best year you've ever had. The very best. Now for those that know to do and don't, this is not going to be the kind of year that it could be. Now, I don't believe I'm speaking to any people like that. But there are a lot of people that this year is going to be the best ever for. But then there's going to be a lot of people that are looking at you and wondering, why is it so good for them and so bad for me? And we're really both pretty much in the same stream. It's because they have not chosen to do what needs to be done according to the word of God. Amen. And it's easy to do. The Bible says that it's the way of the transgressor, the way of the rebellious, the way of those that know to do but don't that is hard. But our way is easy. If you can fight off the haters, if you can forgive the loudmouths, if you can move away from the hecklers, then life is so, so easy. Amen. Amen.